Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the AAMS's CME Expert Series. It's 7 p.m., and we are going to get our program um, going. Just a, a few announcements to let you know that these uh, periodic series that the Armenian American Medical Society is putting together uh, they are a multidisciplinary uh, series of lectures with experts within the field that, and these are typically going to be hitting various aspects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as it pertains to the practice of medicine, healthcare, as well as other things that may be relevant to the community at large, some patients, and so on. So these events are brought to you by the Armenian American Medical Society. We thank the board for working hard at this under the leadership of Dr. Kevin Galistian, who has been uh, very proactive in facilitating these, organizing these sessions. Uh, we also would like to thank our, um, you know, our CME committee. Uh, just wanna give a recognition of, uh, of um, our CME committee. Dr. Rami Apelian, Dr. Garni Barhudarian, Dr. Kevin Galstian, Dr. Arsine Kalfayan, Dr. Armon Kotikian, myself, Dr. Vikan Sepilian as the chair. And of course, many thanks to Hasmi Keribarian, who is, uh, you know, who uh, is truly the moving force behind the scene. So uh, tonight we actually have two webinars uh, and one of them is scheduled to be at seven and there's another one that has a different link and a completely different meeting um, that starts at 8 p.m. So on the conclusion of this one, we please click on the other link to start the other webinar at 8 p.m. We will also place that link in the chat of this meeting. So anyone um, can go from this meeting to the other. So um, tonight's first webinar is about the essentials of telemedicine. It's gonna be delivered by Dr. Rami Apelian. Dr. Apelian is a board member of the Armenian American Medical Society. He is currently holds the membership chair. He is also part of the Continuing Medical Education Committee. Uh, Dr. Apelian has been in the community. He's a board certified neurologist and has been practicing in the community for over 10 years. Um, and he um, is uh, very active in, in, um, uh, in uh, educating uh, not only the community, uh, trainees, uh, postgraduate physicians, as well as physicians who are in practice. His uh, talk is gonna be on telemedicine. I'd like to point out that we have a series of talks on telemedicine. Dr. Apelian is a physician who uh, has been engaging in telemedicine for the past uh, month or so since the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. And he had to um, uh, evolve his practice from an in-person practice to a telemedicine practice. And he's gonna share with us some of the essentials and some of the uh, actual pitfalls and so on that he has gone through. Now, just to announce that there's a second telemedicine lecture, which will be um, delivered by Dr. Edward Keftarian on Thursday at 7 p.m. Dr. Keftarian is a telemedicine expert and has been doing this for years. He's a national, uh, nationally renowned tele telepsychiatry expert, and he's gonna give a different perspective on telemedicine on Thursday evening. With that, um, I would like to now ask Dr. Apelian, uh, Dr. Rami Apelian, who is a board certified neurologist to actually begin tonight's educational program and uh, talk to us about uh, telemedicine, the essentials of telemedicine in the era of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Sapilian, and I wanna thank everybody uh, who is here today. Let me quickly share my screen so that we are on the same page. Okay, uh, I don't know if any of you had an opportunity to watch Saturday Night Live this last weekend. Tom Hanks did a monologue from his kitchen with a laugh track 
uh, behind him and an audience track. Unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of even having fake responses to today's discussion, but uh, hopefully uh, we are engaged and uh, we are going to learn something today. Uh, I'm here to talk to everybody about the guidelines that have changed uh, as far as the delivery and reimbursement of telemedicine services. Uh, because of COVID-19, because of uh, coronavirus and the pandemic, uh, CMS and the Department of Health and Human Services have decided uh, to allow for expansion of telemedicine services. So today is going to dive into uh, how I, out of necessity, needed to shift my practice, but also uh, make sure that my staff were engaged and my patients still had access to me, as well as still providing for my community uh, when it came time for uh, you know, preventing people from going to the emergency room unnecessarily. Excuse me. All right, so uh, this is a CME talk, so I do want to start with some disclosures. Uh, I do have consulting relationships with numerous pharmaceutical companies. None of that will be of conflict today because of the content I'm presenting. Uh, I may mention a number of products that can be used for telemedicine services. Uh, this is not really to serve as an endorsement or a criticism of any particular platform, uh, just really for the sake of uh, providing information. So this is the roadmap for today's discussion. Uh, I really wanna make sure that everyone understands the difference between telehealth and telemedicine. Uh, I want everybody watching to perhaps have uh, a thought as to how you can incorporate uh, telemedicine in your practice. Uh, maybe identify certain aspects of your practice that would benefit from this. Uh, there are certain aspects that may not. There are risks, there are benefits, there are challenges of implementing a new delivery service. So I'm gonna share with you my experience and uh, perhaps you know, use that as a guiding tool for you. We're gonna talk about coding. Uh, it's important that we understand how telehealth services are coded either uh, before or after the change that uh, has occurred in March of 2020. And then, really wanna identify some specific challenges as to how that can influence your, your further treatment. <clears throat> so I mentioned that I wanna really delineate between telehealth and telemedicine. And the definitions are actually pretty cut and dry. Telehealth is actually defined by uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the HRSA of the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to support and promote long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, public health, and health administration using technologies which include video conferencing, the internet, store and forward imaging, streaming media, and terrestrial and wireless communications. And while it's a lot of verbiage, at the end of the day, the, the take home point is, is that telehealth extends beyond the application of technology for delivery of healthcare services. And that, that's really the, the, the point I want everyone to understand. Oftentimes the words telehealth and telemedicine are used interchangeably in, in typical language, but I'm not necessarily sure that that's accurate. So the, the, the word telehealth actually refers to a much broader scope of being able to provide remote information rather than the word telemedicine. So what is telemedicine? And the best definition I could find for telemedicine came from the American Academy of Family Practice. And they say telemedicine is the practice of medicine using technology to deliver care at a distance. A physician in one location uses a telecommunications infrastructure to develop, so excuse me, to deliver care to a patient at a distance site. And I think this is really what we all think of uh, when we say telehealth or telemedicine. So who can practice telemedicine? I'm gonna focus this aspect of the conversation strictly on outpatient telemedicine. Inpatient telemedicine has been used uh, in the setting of acute strokes, providing ER services for at least 10 years now. That's really not the scope of today's conversation. The scope of today's conversation is focusing on outpatient services. So prior to March 17th, 2020, 
And you're going to see later, I'm going to reference March 13th, 2020. And the rationale behind this is that an executive order was placed on March 13th, but we did not receive guidance from HHS until March 17th, 2020. So prior to March 17th, 2020, the patient, those, that, that person who was receiving telehealth services needed to live in a rural or underserved area. And the physician had to be licensed in the state from which he, was broadcast, he or she was broadcasting uh, and had to be licensed in the state where the patient was receiving services. So while in a large state like California, that may not be much of an issue, uh, there are certainly cities uh, in the United States that share borders between states. Uh, I can think of Tahoe here uh, locally, where part of the city is in California, parts in Nevada. Kansas City is another wonderful example. So um, the physician who was providing telehealth services needed to be licensed in both the delivery state and the receiving state. Additionally, patients actually had to leave their home and go to an outside location in order to have service delivered. They had to go to a designated uh, authorized site, authorized clinic or hospital in order to actually be able to communicate with a doctor on the delivery end. There were well-established definitions for virtual check-ins. And the reason I put that in quotes is because essentially these were phone calls that physicians could bill for based on time, but provided significantly reduced reimbursement uh, and uh, required certain time restrictions and time constraints in order to even be billable. So they weren't necessarily practical. Additionally, Medicare Part B does, or excuse me, did have clauses for e-visits provided that the patient and the physician engaged in non-face-to-face communication through the patient portal, non-face-to-face, -face, meaning they are not in the same room. However, it did require video services, again, at a significantly reduced rate compared to standard e and coding. And this is an important point. Physicians and patients had to have an established relationship. You could not do a new consultation with a patient uh, via telehealth. So what's different now? And I wanna to introduce to you the current healthcare climate and, and what it is we're navigating and why this is important. On January 31st, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services issued a public health emergency in the United States related to COVID-19. On March 13th, the President of the United States declared a national state of emergency under the National Emergencies Act. It's that combination of events that allowed a waiver under section 1135 of the Social Security Act that the secretary may temporarily waive or modify certain Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, CHIP requirements to ensure that sufficient healthcare items and services are available to meet the needs of individuals enrolled in the SSA programs, in the emergency area and time periods that providers who provide such services in good faith can be reimbursed and exempted from sanctions. Now, understand that the individuals enrolled in the emergency area suddenly became the United States of America. This was beyond FEMA. This is beyond a local disaster. This became a national disaster. So the entire national delivery of healthcare services changed by the fact that both of these events uh, overlapped. The specific language used in HHS's publication, really I want to kind of focus on a couple of different aspects here. On the first bullet point you see that physicians and other healthcare professionals, uh, the fact that they needed to be licensed in the state in which they were providing services and potentially delivering services that, that, that requirement went away for all Medicare patients, all Medicaid patients and all CHIP patients. So all federally funded programs were able to say, hey, we're gonna pay you, just deliver services, please. 
self-referral sanctions associated to the start program were dismissed and the performance deadlines and timetables could be adjusted uh, but not necessarily waived. What does that mean? That really has to do with meaningful use and MIPS for those of you who are using an EHR. Uh, some of those requirements were, were put on hold. But why? Why did all of this happen? At the end of the day, I think the American Medical Association summed it up best. They said, we did, we're doing all this to limit the risk of COVID-19 infection for patients and other persons who could be exposed from an in-person visit. So this is here to protect the physician from an asymptomatic carrier that may be coming into their office. This is here to protect the patient from potentially being exposed by a physician carrier who is asymptomatic. Uh, this is to protect people from being in crowded spaces and really observing the social distancing laws and the stay at home laws, but still allowing us to provide care for our patients uh, in a way that is ethical and appropriately reimbursed. So what are the current guidelines for practicing telemedicine? So I told you that on March 13th, President Trump declared the national state of emergency. And the fact that we had a public health emergency previously initiated allowed for these changes to occur. We weren't informed as physicians until March 17th, uh, 2020. If you all remember, the, the date that the national emergency was declared was March 13th, and this was a Friday. So we all remember Friday, March 13th, because that was the day all of our lives changed. Uh, it's the day our children officially stopped going to school. It was the day that uh, essential businesses uh, were defined. But the delivery of healthcare, despite the fact that on March 13th, healthcare was defined as uh, being an essential service, we, we were not provided any guidance until the 17th, so that was Tuesday, uh, on how we could do this. So uh, Medicare was issued a waiver allowing for the expansion of telehealth by HHS. And this really was granted by the President's Emergency Declaration. Now, office, hospital, and other visits furnished by a telehealth across the country and including in the patient's places of residence was going to be reimbursed retroactive to March 6, 2020. So that means that the patient did not have to leave their home in order to actually be able to correspond with their doctor and have the visit reimbursed. Additionally, instead of using the telehealth codes that previously were present or some of the uh, less uh, profitable or less uh, reimbursed uh, e-visit codes, uh, standard e &M codes would apply. Medicare did, however, dictate that if telehealth services are provided, the point of service needed to be switched from a traditional 11 or 12, 11 being in an office setting, 12 being in an uh, outpatient hospital setting, to point of service 2, which was defined as a telemedicine location. Additionally, uh, although it's not on the slide, uh, CMS is requiring physicians that are providing telehealth services in locations outside their office, such as in their home, to register their home address as a point of service location. But what about the liability? Well, HHS said they weren't gonna conduct audits to ensure that prior relationship existed for claims submitted during this public health emergency. That means that physicians, for the first time ever in the United States, were allowed to provide telehealth services to new patients. Patients who were not established to have a relationship with the physician with whom they're calling. And this is important because this, this system was designed to allow physicians to not only care and can provide cont continuity of care for their patients, but also to ensure that any patient who had a question about any medical condition, especially COVID-19, was able to reach out to a physician and that the physician would be available to them. This is a complete change in the, in the diagnostic and therapeutic paradigm. So a question that I get from a lot of my colleagues who have watched me kind of do this is to say, you know, like, how do I do this? How can I practice telemedicine? And really the expansion of the telemedicine requirements actually only requires 
interactive audio and video telecommunication system that permit real-time communication between the patient and the physician. So on top of all that, it doesn't really restrict it to physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, midwives, CNAs, psychologists, social workers, dietitians, and nutritional professionals were granted uh, protection uh, to provide telemedicine services. And it's because CMS thought it's absolutely important during this public health emergency that patients stay at home as much as possible. Don't go to the physician's office. Don't go to a clinic. Don't go to a hospital. And don't go to other healthcare facilities where you could risk your own health or the health of somebody else. Uh, the whole point of this was to really reinforce how important the um, the, the stay-at-home orders really were to, to the federal government. So what do you need? This is actually interesting, and it all depends on what your, uh, your long-term goals are, but at the very least, a device capable of connecting to the internet, a device with a camera, a device with a microphone, and a reliable internet connection. So pretty much a smartphone will do the trick at this point. Uh, especially under the fact that the HIPAA waiver exists. I, I told you about the fact that HIPAA is not going to be enforced, and this is really to ensure that patients can have access to their physician by a, any platform possible. So you can use a tablet, you can use a laptop, a desktop, a cell phone, I mean, any, of the, any device that meets the aforementioned cr criteria. So what does the patient need? Exactly the same. And so FaceTime suddenly became a means of providing healthcare. Skype suddenly became a means of providing healthcare services. Any video to video telecommunication system suddenly became a means for delivering healthcare services. I mentioned virtual check ins and e visits. <clears throat> These were defined before the changes that, that we've been discussing. And there were different criteria, different electronics requirements. Uh, there was also a completely different coding structure that, that resulted in lesser reimbursement, as I mentioned. All of this information is available on CMS's website. Their press release really details that. I don't wanna focus on this because really what I wanna focus on is how to maintain your practice in the setting of requiring uh, telehealth, excuse me, telemedicine services. So this slide is actually a telemedicine coding summary. And I wanna focus right now on the top third of this slide where we talk about the Medicare telehealth visits. Essentially your 99201 through 99205, your 99211 and your nine, through your 99215, which are your new patient visits and your, uh, your uh, routine follow-up visits are now reimbursed on an outpatient basis. The criteria for which you can bill has not changed. So whether you are dealing with a complex history, whether you're dealing with a complex physical exam, uh, difficult decision making, all of those factors that go into the coding structure that was previously defined by CMS still apply. Now there are codes for inpatient emergency department uh, consultations via telehealth that's outside the scope of today's conversation, as well as follow-ups for inpatient telehealth conversation uh, outside the scope of today's discussion. I did mention to you that there are e-visits. Uh, essentially, e-visits are either defined by telephone call or by camera should you want to use them. Uh, they are coded as below uh, with the 9941 sorry, 9942 blank, depending on the level of complexity. Uh, again, I, I discourage the use of these services since everybody at this point has a telecommunication device that has video, audio, and a reliable internet connection. So I mentioned to you the HIPAA compliance waiver. This actually came from the Office of Civil Rights uh, this is a division of the Department of Health and Human Services, and they basically said that in, if you're acting in good faith and providing telehealth services during COVID-19's uh, uh, national public health emergency, 
there would not be any enforcement of HIPAA issues. So you could use what were traditionally defined as non-HIPAA compliant mechanisms of communication. And this is FaceTime, Skype, WhatsApp, whatever you can do to, to do video to video. And this really was in, designed with a specific intent. Medical providers were empowered to serve patients during this public health emergency, really providing care to those that are most at risk, including older persons and persons with disabilities. Now you look at this and you say, okay, telemedicine, electronic devices, older persons, persons with disabilities. I'm not sure this meshes well. Um, and I can tell you this is one of the challenges that I'm going to address as we discuss uh, the, the implementation challenges that I have faced. So I briefly want to discuss products and services that can provide telemedicine services. I, there's no magic solution here. Uh, there are a number of service providers and like all things in medicine, you have to do a risk benefit analysis. Um, there are numerous professional associations that have directories of different telemedicine service providers. I encourage you to look at them. I encourage you to um, perhaps educate yourself on the risks and the benefits. Some, some of the features overlap with things that already exist in uh, standard EHRs. So, uh, this is something that, that is worth uh, some, some investigation. But you really have to ask yourself, what are your goals? Um, do you want to preserve access to your patients during this difficult time? If the answer is yes, then anything goes. I mean, whether you want to use a platform that's well-defined or you want to use a uh, routinely available video platform, uh, obviously uh, anything goes if you want to say yes to that. What about minimizing patient travel to, to the office, minimizing exposure to the patient, staff, you know, ultimately my family when I go home. Well, again, anything goes. Any platform will work under these circumstances. But the question you really have to ask yourself is, is this supposed to be a short-term fix? Or is this something that you're potentially going to try to utilize should you have the permission moving forward? And I think that's really the defining characteristic of whether or not you are going to want to invest in a platform that can develop telehealth services. Now, on top of all that, you have to understand that if you do develop telehealth services using one of these readily available platforms like Skype or FaceTime or, or WhatsApp, uh, that will require you to, to, to give your patient some personal information, whether it's an email address or a phone number by which they can reach you. So it's important that you really understand those risks as well. So really the short-term options are all readily available. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, really the biggest risk is that um, you, you may have to expose some uh, personal contact information. Uh, also, obviously, older patients may not be able to understand the technology or utilize it well. So a lot of our older patients have required uh, uh, assistance from their, from their children or neighbors to help them through this. Uh, long-term plans, uh, you know, really the biggest risk with any of the long-term solutions is, is cost. Uh, most of these long-term solutions, uh, assuming that the HIPAA waiver is not going to last forever, these are HIPAA compliant solutions, so they, they do cost money. Um, and again, now you're also asking older patients, those patients that are most at risk, to, to learn how to use a different technological platform in order for you to, 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 to develop services. Let's talk about the patient portal for a second. Uh, if you have an EHR with a patient portal, oftentimes there are premium services associated with the patient portal that will allow you to have HIPAA compliant conversations with your patients that meet all the aforementioned criteria uh, to, to bill appropriately. Uh, and you know, having a patient portal and having a, an EHR obviously helps with meaningful use and, and MIPS and sensitization. So, uh, if, if you have been, uh, you know, trying to, to, to meet compliance issues, this probably is not news to you, but if you are new to an EHR or have not yet experienced the incentive programs that are offered by CMS, uh, this is an opportunity for you to really get patients more engaged uh, in their own healthcare by being involved with the patient portal. All right. 
the meat and potatoes, uh, the challenges I've faced in implementation. So integrating this into private practice has been tough. Uh, in fact, when we signed up with the platform provider that we signed up for, none of my staff had ever used this platform. I had never used this platform. Uh, we were talking about whether or not we were gonna run this in the office or run this from home. Uh, and ultimately I chose to uh, shut down the practice for uh, about a day and a half or two days, which if you think about it uh, in a Monday through Friday outpatient practice, uh, shutting down for two days is about 10% of your, uh, uh, you know, your month. Uh, so that, that was, that did require a, a loss of, of income, a uh, loss of cash flow. Uh, but it was important to me to sit down with my staff members and try to establish a, a protocol that would work for us. And that really required their engagement. And so this was actually an opportunity that in retrospect, I look back and I say was a very great team building opportunity uh, because my staff and I got to implement new protocols that worked for everybody, uh, worked for the patient, worked for them, them and their workflow, wasn't terribly disruptive and still allowed me to continue to see my patients. Now, one of the biggest challenges we faced is coordinating with the patient remotely. And we, we instituted some protocols so that our staff could essentially communicate with the patient offline, ensure that they're getting on board, and then that, that staff uh, member would communicate with me so I could get in on the call. If I'm on a telephone call, however, or excuse me, a video call, um, and I place orders into the EHR, one of the other you know, operational issues we faced is how do we deliver orders to that patient? And my staff were actually very diligent with uh, coming up with various solutions to ensure that the uh, orders, whether they were labs or radiology or uh, referrals to outside sources were adequately delivered to the patient. Another challenge is prior authorizations. Uh, we know that a number of medications, particularly brand name medications, require prior authorizations. A number of medical procedures, whether they're radiographic or even uh, something as simple as physical therapy, require uh, us to get prior authorizations. So how was I, as a physician, going to communicate to my staff who is not engaged in the uh, interaction between me and my patient that a, uh, an order was placed and that a prior auth would have to be done? And this was something that we also had to navigate. Ultimately, the reason we have telehealth is to minimize people's risk, whether that's the doctor, the patient, or the staff's risk of potential exposure to uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And so this required a lot of trust uh, that my staff would work from home and that you know, while they are on the clock, they are working, and while they are off the clock, I'm not going to bother them. So it, re it did require a lot of dual... Uh, understanding. Now, at the time I made these slides, the information uh, did not, uh, the information provided did not actually account for what the private payers would do. Now, it's important to understand this 1135 waiver that we've been discussing is a Medicare waiver, and under no circumstances are private payers required to follow federal guidelines. However, in good faith, they have. And uh, as providers, we're, we're always receiving emails uh, from uh, numerous insurance companies insure, uh, assuring us that they will continue to provide services. Um, one of the conflicts here, however, is that some of the provider, uh, sorry, some of the insurance providers actually have their own platforms for telehealth services. And this was a conflict that I, I was uh, very motivated to address early on and through the help of uh, the CMA, the California Medical Association, as well as LACMA, the Los Angeles County Medical Association, uh, I was able to actually get a lot of questions answered. And just because patients have a platform that's designated to them by the insurance provider, uh, did not exclude me from being able to see my own patients via telehealth services. So this was a huge plus uh, and a huge win for us as physicians. Uh, I'm getting constant emails, constant faxes, constant mail to the office about the different insurance provider's commitment to reimbursing physicians for telehealth services. Oftentimes, if you're seeing a patient with telehealth services, um, some of the cost sharing 
uh, uh, definitions have been waived as well. You'll, you'll have to refer to your contract and, and each specific payer's website. However, uh, payers are indeed reimbursing. And I can tell you that I began doing this as early as March 16th or March 17th, and I have received reimbursement for the telehealth services. So how are you going to build this? How are you going to code? How are you going to get paid? So using outpatient telehealth service at this time, uh, using the criteria defined by the Department of Health and Human Services and uh, the Centers for Medicaid Services, you just build standard E&M services. So that's 99201 through 99205 for new patient visits, 99211 to 99215. I, that's a typo. I apologize. 99215 for routine outpatient services. And um, basically, there's two ways you can meet criteria to uh, satisfy the requirements for each of these codes. One is to build based on content. That's the complexity of the history, the complexity of the physical exam, the complexity of your decision making. Um, and oftentimes, that's actually going to be challenging to do in a telehealth environment because your physical exam is limited. You can't listen to the heart. You can't listen to the abdomen. You can't palpate. So a lot of the uh, criteria in order to meet minimum amounts of physical exam criteria cannot be met. So I've taken the choice of simply billing based on time. You can discuss what strategy works for your practice uh, with your biller. So, uh, you know, the criteria, as I mentioned, are defined well by the AMA. Uh, excuse me. Uh, all right. So the billing based on time, uh, we're running out of time in today's discussion, and I want to make sure we have enough time for the questions. So I'm just going to kind of race through this, but there are resources available uh, to provide you uh, coding requirements based on time. The short vision, version is that as long as you meet this minimum threshold and you, you can bill uh, the, the code associated with that time, if you go past that threshold, as long as you are greater than 50% of the time difference between the current threshold and the next threshold, you can build the next threshold. But there is a caveat. And more than 50% of the time spent during the clinical encounter has to be dedicated to counseling the patient. And I highly recommend that if you document that you've spent 30 minutes with the patient, greater than 50% 50, 50 of which was used to counsel the patient, you specify what you counseled the patient on. Now we have to talk about liability. This is an important uh, point moving forward uh, with telehealth. So, you know, payers have indicated that during the COVID-19 crisis, they're offering a waiver of cost sharing. This essentially means if you do telehealth visit, most private payers will not require a copay. Additionally, if patients have a deductible, the deductible requirements are being waived so that you get paid for your services. As the other important issue is medical malpractice. Um, numerous medical malpractice insurers have advice on their website. Obviously, the ones in California that are the biggest are CAP, MPT, and the doctor's company. Both are encouraging their physicians to uh, uh, continue with telehealth services. There are guidelines that they recommend to minimize liability and exposure. And I would refer you to your, your specific provider uh, for that information. So uh, I mentioned the Los Angeles County Medical Association, the California Medical Association. Uh, they were instrumental in helping me to implement my uh, uh, tele telemedicine services. Um, the American Medical Association also has a very good website. Uh, they call it the Physician Quick Guide to Telemedicine. Uh, these are the websites. Uh, these slides will be available for you after the, the, the conclusion of today's discussion. So all of this information and all these resources will be available to you. So I, I want to thank everybody for their time today. Uh, I'm happy to open up the conversation for some questions. Uh, in order to do so, I am going to stop sharing my slides, and I think Dr. Sapelian, you're going to be moderating. Is that correct? Yes, I will, and it looks like we have several questions that have come through. Okay, great. Um, and uh, we have a question from Dr. Nick Hazarian that says, when a patient refuses visual, can you still bill an EMA code, my understanding is that it must be audio and visual. 
Uh, and that's actually a correct understanding. If the patient is refusing uh, camera or visual, uh, then you have to rely on the uh, e-visit or uh, quick check-in codes, the 9924s, um, which were listed in that uh, graph. Uh, and information about this is also available on the AMA's website in that resource I provided. Uh, there is an, a question from Dr. Armen Cherik. What was your ex what has your experience been with HMOs and PPOs reimbursing for telemedicine? Are authorizations required? So a separate authorization, uh, from my experience with the HMOs, has not been required. If a patient was authorized to see you for a routine outpatient visit and you decide to convert that from an in-person visit to a telemedicine visit, uh, the documentation I've received from the HMOs with whom I'm contracted have indicated that that's okay. As far as the PPOs, uh, you know, the two PPOs that I actually have received the most communication from are Anthem, Blue Cross, and Cigna, and they have all indicated that uh, telehealth services uh, would be provided uh, reimbursement at the uh, standard ENM coding. Anything that they said that you could do in your office that you transition to uh, electronic or tele telemedicine would be reimbursed uh, equivalently. Great. Um... There's a question that says, is there a requirement on the length of the ac actual telemedicine visit? So that, that is, there's no actual requirement uh, for the length of any particular visit. However, how you code your visit is going to be based on time, uh, as I suggested, or on the criteria of content uh, defined by the AMA and CMS. Uh, Dr. Barhudaryan is asking, how do you divide labor with your telehealth visits? Uh, divide labor. Okay, so currently, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming you mean like, what do I do with my staff? So yes. my and uh, follow-up question to that is, what do the MAs do? Right. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, essentially, I actually have two MAs on the floor of my t uh, telehealth visit. Uh, alternating between patients. Uh, those patients are pre-assigned pre to a specific MA. Uh, by the MAs, they coordinate that uh, before the close of business uh, the previous day. And they say, okay, I'll take patient A, you take patient B, and then they alternate A, B, A, B throughout the rest of the day. They essentially get on the call with the patient about five or 10 minutes before I'm supposed to be on that call, ensure that the technology is working. They notify me that I'm ready to go. I come in on the call, I do my work while the second MA is now working on the next call and so on. Another question here is, uh, how do you do your neuro exams via telehealth? You know, that's a great question. And this is, um, this is one of the challenges that certainly we face. I think there are certain disease states that lend themselves to telehealth better than others. Um, however, uh, a sensory exam is impossible. I mean, let's just call it what it is. There's no way you can actually assess someone's sensation. However, there are other surrogate markers you can use to determine patient's ability to proprioceptive or uh, perhaps uh, feel. And you know, the gait exam is a very good example of this. Uh, asking a patient to stand up with their eyes closed and checking Romberg certainly can help with some of the sensory components. Uh, checking for dysmetria on finger, nose, finger can certainly serve as a surrogate. Uh, the motor exam, otherwise, uh, you know, if a patient doesn't have pronate or drift, for instance, uh, you know that they have full strength proximally in their upper extremities. Uh, if you're not dealing with any weakness in the limbs, perhaps uh, as a complaint, uh, testing grip is not really that important. So there are ways of, of knowing, I mean, having a patient walk on their heels, walk on their toes, certainly will tell you what their distal strength is like. So there are other aspects of the neurological exam that can compensate for things that you cannot accomplish without tactile uh, function. Thank you. There's a comment here from uh, Christina Davitian saying, amazing talk. Thank you very much for including this as a webinar topic. Very interested in how this will most definitely affect me as a future provider. Indeed, the, this, you know, maybe uh, this uh, pandemic may change the way we practice medicine. And as such, we are planning on doing a series of these webinars, uh, as Dr. Apelian pointed today pointed out that today is April 13th and the information being presented today is relevant and accurate for 
today. However, things may change and we will bring you updates as updates come along. Um, Dr. Nick Hazarian is asking, uh, do, do you document a start time and an end time of your calls in the note? I do not. Um, and uh, the documentation requirements do not require you to do so. Uh, as long as you are documenting the amount of time you spent with the patient, uh, that, that really has been the criteria, whether or not telemedicine is involved or not. Um, uh, the, a physician is assumed to be uh, honest and attesting at the time that they are signing their note that the information provided is accurate. Uh, we have a question here. What are your thoughts about the future of telemedicine in upcoming years post COVID-19 era? Well, I mean, so I, I mentioned what are your short-term goals and what are your long-term goals? And my anticipation is that we will be providing telehealth services or telemedicine services in the outpatient setting moving forward. Um, I, I, this, is, this was my assumption and, and consequently, I decided to go with a platform that is subscription based for my practice. Do I have any guarantees? No, this is my assumption. Uh, but since I am in charge of my own practice, uh, I do have to make some decisions and uh, anticipate what the future may yield. So I'm investing now uh, thinking that this will be a platform that we will be utilizing later. Another question is, if you can't perform a specific examination, such as reflexes, muscle strength testing, sensory testing, pulses, etc., what is the actual wording we should be documenting in the chart? I'm assuming omitting that physical exam section is unadvisable. So I actually always document a physical exam. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is in any face-to-face -face conversation, you do have a, a, some uh, physical attributes that you can comment on. Uh, things that are reliable are the patient's uh, affect, their mood, their orientation, their ability to answer questions, uh, whether or not they look disheveled or not. Um, the uh, cranial nerve exam essentially could be done by camera. Uh, does the patient have any facial asymmetry? Uh, do they have any dysarthria? Uh, is there any uh, witnessed uh, weakness in the face? Uh, again, the motor exam can be essentially done by camera. Um, while you're not going to be able to necessarily test specific strength of specific segments, uh, you can tell by the way the patient is moving whether or not there's any exhibited weakness or spasticity. Uh, the sensory exam and the reflex exam are completely out the window, um, but coordination and gait can certainly be assessed as well. I will document all of that. I will also document at the beginning of my physical exam that the, the visit was conducted via telehealth, so the physical exam is limited to certain features. Very good. Um, another question here. There's more uncertainties when I am talking with the patient. I am not sure what is going on. Number one, what do you do when the patient asks for a COVID test? So I, 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 you have to follow the county guidelines. You have to follow the state guidelines on this. I mean, you know, as a neurologist, I actually have encountered a couple of my routine uh, headache patients or epilepsy patients who have come down with symptoms su uh, suggestive of COVID, and they've asked me what to do. Um, you know, uh, this was about a week ago uh, when COVID testing was still restricted to patients above the age of 65 uh, or patients who were in the first week of their recommended quarantine. Um, and ultimately I was the one making the recommendation for quarantine. So they were ultimately eligible, uh, because the week started from the time that I'm recommending quarantine. Um, patients demanding a test is not of any benefit. Uh, it's important that patients understand from us, the epidemiology of, of the disease, uh, testing process. And the, the fact is, is that uh, the testing is, is right now reserved for symptomatic individuals so we can establish the death rate of the examination. We will eventually have information as to whether or not this disease is prevalent in the community or how prevalent it had been once we get antibody testing. But at the current information that we have, if you're not symptomatic, there's no reason to get tested because that's going to be a negative test that could have been uh, given to somebody who potentially actually was symptomatic and positive. Um, there is a comment from Dr. Nice, uh, Dr. Doug Nice. Office-based physicians should use their usual place of service code to be paid 
at the non-facility rate for telehealth services and add modifier 95 to telehealth claim lines. Telehealth services billed using POS code 02 telehealth will be paid at the facility rate. And there is also a link which I will, um, uh, is in the Q&A and I will place that link in the chat. Um, and Dr. Nice also has a question. Can you comment about the AMA view that place of service can be your office and not O2? So this is obviously a current conflict between what CMS wants and what physicians want. And the AMA naturally is a uh, physician advocacy group. It's a physician lobbying group, and they're trying to go head to head with CMS as to uh, how to best help physicians maintain reimbursement. Now, f CMS wants to delineate what services are being provided in office and face to face from in office telehealth. And so, even though they're uh, asking us to go O2, uh, they are suggesting in their language that they will not be reimbursing us at a reduced rate. Now, prior to March 17th, 2020, if you used O2, you were reimbursed at a reduced rate. So this is a, one of those wait and see moments, unfortunately. We have, uh, this has only been policy for literally one month. And uh, this is about the time that we're submitting our billing and seeing stuff coming back. I can tell you from the private payer standpoint, they have actually been better at reimbursing in a timely manner. And I have seen full reimbursement for my O2 services based on uh, previous 11 services that, that existed, if that makes sense. Great, thank you very much. I just want to remind everybody that we do have another webinar, uh, which is gonna start at 8 p.m. Uh, there is a separate link for it as it will, it's a uh, separate topic. Um, and it, if, if you would like to get that link, it, it was emailed to you. However, uh, Hasmi Keribarian has also placed the link to that webinar in the chat. So you can copy it or click on it to, uh, uh, to join the other webinar, which is delivered, it's, which is gonna be delivered by an infection control officer at California Rehab Hospital. Um, and it's about uh, infection prevention um, in, in both in the workplace as well as in the household. It's a very, very interesting talk. Dr. Apelian, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sibelian. For this very informative talk. As we said, our plan is to have a series of these telehealth talks. Uh, there is a, another one that is on, um, on Thursday, Thursday evening at 7 by Dr. Kefterian, who is a telepsychiatry specialist. We also have a series of physician wellness lectures uh, that are scheduled. Dr. Um, Doug Nice, who is uh, um, listening on this part, on, on this lecture, is scheduled to be one of our speakers coming up sometime in the next few sessions. Please check your emails, and I'm going to encourage all of you to switch over to uh, um, to the other uh, presentation, which we're going to have at 8 p.m. Dr. Pellian, again, thank you very much. And thank you very much. We'll see you in a few minutes. Take care now. Take care. Take care.